is going to be uh, in this room is uh, Quranic and Arabic, Quranic and Islamic education inside and outside the public school. Okay, and that'll be running from now for one hour. Um, I intentionally, uh, this is Naeem, right? Yes. Okay, I intentionally <laughs> asked Naeem to um, hold up on the handout. It's a teacher thing, because if we give you the handout, you read the handout, okay? And you get to take it with you. Uh, some of the things in the handout I will touch on this morning, some things I will touch on this afternoon. And I haven't had a chance to talk with the imam and see how I was fortunate enough to get scheduled for two workshops. And um, I'm trying to keep my energy level up. I've been very, very ill, so bear with me. Hopefully my voice will stay with me. I'm just recuperating from the flu, and I'm not quite there. But um, inshallah, we'll be able to uh, do something that will be worthwhile and meaningful for you as it relates to Islamic education, especially in our public schools, and also how it impacts the status of our children. Because whether your children are in Islamic schools or in public schools, uh, as I heard uh, a presenter say one day, we may have come over on different boats. Okay, but we're all in the same boat now. And our children are going to be a part of this society. They're not going to live in the masjid. They are going to live in the United States of America or somewhere else. And when you travel to the quote unquote Islamic countries, then um, most people that I have talked to say that America is the best place to practice Islam. We have more freedom to truly follow the Quran here in America because of the way the Constitution was written. Even though it was only written for a certain group of people. They forgot to say, we're only writing this, okay, for rich, white, European landowners. That was their intent. So we have that document, and that document is about to give us our day in America. And this I have on authority because Allah has blessed me to be in certain positions to find out. And I'm going to share some of that with you today so that you will know what is legally happening in our country that's going to protect us, that's going to also get Islamic education into the very fiber of this society. And I'm going to start off uh, from the paper because I want to do just like uh, the Imam said. I'm going to go from the general to the specific. When we speak of Quranic education, we must view it from a very basic point of view. The basis of all education is tawhid, or unity. We can't get around that. This is the beginning and the end of human knowledge. And as Muslims, we know that. We know that all knowledge in the creation was here to onset. There's nothing out here that man is going to discover that Allah didn't create at the inception of creation. Allah tells us, verily, your God is one, Lord of the heavens and the earth and all between them, and Lord of every point at the rising of the sun. And Surah Taha says, but the God of you all is one God. There is no God but he, he embraces all things. Allah sent us prophets. Prophets have been given to us for human guidance. That's their main function, is to educate people properly so that they might understand and act in a better way. I put that in here because when the prophets came, they brought us a message, okay? It wasn't an isolated message. It was a message to help all mankind, to help the entire society. The goal is clear, and it's set forth in the Quran. Man's purpose on this earth is to be the Khalifa. Man's purpose on the earth 
is to protect this society and this creation. I don't know how many of you have heard the story. It's a story they tell children. And you had all of the, the animals there. You had man. You had angels. You had jinn. And Allah said, who will be the caretaker? Man said, I will. I'll do it. Okay. And Allah gave that mission to man. Okay. And like I said, it's a children's story. But we get the children to begin to understand that because man has that mission on this earth, then he has a special responsibility that nothing else in creation has. And no responsibility in creation is greater than that. Allah tells us in the Quran, it is he who sent among the unlettered a messenger from among themselves to recite to them his revelations, to purify them of their sins and faults, that they may grow in rank and status, and to teach them the book and wisdom, although they had before been in manifest error. In Surah Yunus we read, O mankind, there has come to you a direction from your Lord and a healing from the diseases in your heart, and for those who believe, a guidance and a mercy. Allah gives us guidelines in the Quran. And he tells us that truth has come before falsehood. Truth has come and falsehood has perished. Truly falsehood is by its nature bound to per perish. We send down in the Quran that which is healing and a mercy to those who believe. To the unjust, it causes nothing but loss. Now the Quran is not a new document. It's not a new book on the planet. And believe you me, Muslims are not the only people who read the Quran. People who are highly educated in our society have mastered the knowledge of the Quran. And they pick and choose what they want us to have. And what has happened as Muslim countries sort of stayed self-contained to themselves, it wasn't that much of a problem. But here in the North America, when a group of people right in their midst began to rise up, studying Quran, there came a concern. And there also came an intimidation. Now let's take a step back. Last week I was in New Orleans at the ASCD conference. ASCD is the Association on, curriculum, on Supervision and Curriculum Development. It's the largest educational association in the world. The conference is so huge that they have to have just the, <laughs> what we have here today, our two pages, our schedule. Theirs was a 396-page, tiny, tiny print, published book. And when I got that book in the mail, and I looked at it, and I said, I got to go through this and decide what I'm going to go to. You know, and I opened it up. I said, oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. I just, I'll do, you know, it's the Scarlett O'Hara approach tomorrow. I think of that tomorrow. And so I didn't deal with it until I actually got to New Orleans. And I said, why did I tell Ella Unified I would come down to this conference? So I, you know, I go in there, just thousands. I mean, we just took up the whole city. You know, thousands of people there from all over the world. So that, we, we flew in on a Friday, a team of us from LA uh, Unified. And our superintendent was in the group and the whole bit. And so we said, okay, we're gonna go out to dinner tonight. We're gonna all take our books and we're gonna sit down and go through them and decide what we're gonna go to. So of course we lied, we ate, had fun, went back to the hotel, went to sleep, got up the next morning. But we did at least go down uh, to the uh, convention center early enough to say, okay, now we have to get on task because when we go back and have to do our report, we won't know what to say. So I'm sitting there and the conference goes every day, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So I'm going through, what am I gonna go to? So I flipped over to Sunday, 
to special sessions. The special sessions are always printed in red so that they get your attention. And these sessions last from three to five hours. Okay, remember, this is a teacher thing. You know, we psych ourselves out and say, oh, yeah, I can hang. You know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm cool. The first session was a three-hour Islamic banquet at the Hilton Hotel. I said, will I be there or will I be there? <laughs> okay? It was on the history of Islamic Spain. And what made me feel so good about that workshop was there were only four Muslims in there, and it was packed. Administrators from all over the world, teachers from all over the world. And when they finished this banquet and served that Islamic meal, which was a mind meal, people took on Islamic personalities of people out of history. I know most of you, or if not everyone, knows about what came out on the internet from uh, Hillary Clinton and how this year, for the first time in the history of America, there was an id festival at the White House because Chelsea was taking world history and Islamic status was a part of it. But the organization that put on this workshop was the organization that gave that package to that school district. It is sponsored, underwritten by Senator McGovern, and you don't have to pay to get it. It's free to any school district in the country. Think of that. Just so that, but the people who present it are Muslims. Now, I went up and I talked to the presenter, and we began to wonder, why are we here doing the things that we're doing? I just got a call. John, you want to go to New Orleans, ASCD? Sure, it's in New Orleans. Yeah, I'll go, okay? I had no real purpose for going to that conference, other than the fact that I didn't have to pay, and I love to go to conferences, and I figured there would be something interesting to find out. When I talked to the presenter, who incidentally gave Qurans to every participant in that workshop. So I did two things. I said, I have a team traveling with me from LA. Can I have Qurans for each one of them? She let me have them. And I did share them, and I said, put it in your library. And one of the ladies in the group said, isn't this the book that they say that's bilingual? Because, you know, that's our little buzz where we're in a bilingual education. And it's written in two languages. I say, yeah, you got the Arabic on one side and you got the English. She said, that's cool. And they, really, and they were so honored that they went out behind my back and bought me an id gift while we were in New Orleans. I talked with Audrey Shabazz, who was the presenter, and she said, Joan, I have tried everything to get into LA Unified. I cannot even get a return call. I cannot even get into a conversation with anyone. So let me take a little flashback. I was at a meeting one night. <clears throat> they called me out of the meeting. This was at our professional development center and said, we want you to talk to Angie Stockwell. She wants someone to do a workshop on multicultural education, but she wants someone who does a year long program in their classroom. And you know, you're the only person we can think who we can really say you actually do it and can prove it. So okay, I'll, I'll do it. I talked to Angie Stockwell and agreed to do the workshop. I went and did the workshop. I didn't know who Angie Stockwell was. When they introduced her, she is one of our superintendents. She is the superintendent over uh, multicultural education. So I told Audrey Shabazz, I said, let me see what I can do. Three days ago, I was at home ill. I said, ah. Let me call Angie. So I called her in the office. And she came to the phone. And she wants me to do a workshop for her in April. So I told her I would. And then I said, by the way, I just left ASCD. 
and they had this Islamic workshop. I said, Angie, it's fabulous. And they want to get that program into LA Unified. Now she's going to speak for me in a class that I teach to teachers on the 18th. She said, bring all the materials for me. You contact Audrey Shabazz and you tell her she is in LA Unified from the superintendent. And it has nothing to do with me. Allah is putting us in positions, if we are willing, to stand for our religion. The county of LA is giving a multicultural uh, training. They sent me to the training. The first day was the day of Ear Prayer. Broke my heart. I didn't want to go. I've not missed Ear Prayer ever. But I didn't know how to say no. And I just said, oh, Allah. I got a fax in the mail, you know, through my school. Guess where the workshop was? Masjid Umar. Started at 8 o'clock. Prayer was at 7. I went to Salat and went upstairs to the workshop. Oh, praise is due to a lot. Okay? They told me, said, guess who came to the night of power? The whole board of directors for LA Unified went to the night of power. And now I'm going to share with you why. There's a directive and there's a state directive that says in education, and this came out from my friend Angie, Dr. Evangelina Stockwell. She's Assistant Superintendent, Office of Intergroup Relations, LAUSD. She gave a definition and directive for the teaching of religion in public schools. This is what has happened. We are in a savage country now. And it is savage because they took religion out of the school. Now that was a good thing when they did because there was only one religion that was recognized and it was Christianity. You see, we have to look at how Allah's plan evolves. So now we have a group of teachers and a group of students at, with parents who have no morals. And believe you me, they have no morals. There's no character development. So then they turned around and they looked at, well, that's what, we, what can we do to teach character? You can't teach character without a moral base. Doesn't make sense. In a minute we're going to talk about what makes sense and how it makes sense. Okay? You can't do it. So what they have had to come back and do is say, look, we're just going to have to go back and tell the truth. There's one God, one creation, and all knowledge comes from this God. But man has a moral responsibility to his society. He is the caretaker. And because we have miseducated the people, we knew this, then our society is falling physically. This is where we have acid rain. You know, our technology is going to destroy us. It has taken us all the way to destruction. Our kids are killing each other in the streets. And if you think L.A. is bad, and Oakland is bad, you need to go to New Orleans. I was overwhelmed. New Orleans. It is unbelievable. You know, I mean, people are just shooting at each other all up and down the freeways and stuff, you know? Because there's no respect for life. In this document that came out and it's mandated for LA Unified, Religion, it says, religion is a significant force in human history. To understand the complex dynamics at work in human society, young people must understand the role of religion in both historic and contemporary events and issues. The Supreme Court, in a First Amendment case, acknowledged that a person's education may not be complete without a study a comparative religion or the history of religion, which is just not enough, but its relationship to the advancement of civilization. 
Recently, the California State Board of Education issued a revised edition of the handbook on the rights and responsibilities of school personnel and students in the area of providing moral, civic, and ethical education teaching about religion, promoting responsible attitudes and behaviors, and preventing uh, and responding to hate violence. This California state document includes the following statement. The California public schools need have no hesitancy in teaching about religion. To the contrary, understanding the historical contributions of religions and key elements of world religion is essential to a complete knowledge of our civilization and to being a well-educated person. So the state of California is saying that if you do not have a moral base, you are an educated fool. And the society cannot use you because you're not beneficial to the society. You are educated just for the sake of being educated. Education with no application is not human. It is not effective. It does not help society. It destroys society. It says to provide students with a full and appropriate education the public schools, and listen to this word, the public schools are obligated to teach about religion, though they must not sponsor or advocate the practice of religion. Now what that means is you cannot teach Islam from a Christian point of view. So what they did in LA Unified was they went to every community and what we have done as educators, there are two things that we have going in Los Angeles. We have a task force that addresses educational issues. That task force, when any time a social science book is being written, that anything that has anything on Islam, that task force goes. It asks for the documents. We want to see what the textbooks are writing. If the state of California is going to adopt it, it must meet our specifications or we're going to protest it. And if you are there to the decision-making time, you impact it. And it hasn't been, been impacted to the extent that there is a full teaching component on Islam. And it was launched with Ramadan. Came out from superintendent's office, my buddy Angie, video on Ramadan, a full documentation on how to teach Islam from kindergarten through 12th grade. And it is mandata mandated. It must be done. There's no teacher has any choice about it. It must be evidenced in your classroom. Administrators will be uh, critiqued and examined as to whether they see that it happens. And everything that they put in there came from this task force. They went and met with them, and this is how the board ended up going to the night of power. Okay? Now, it goes a step further. Children now can take the ids without any type of altercation. They can take religious holidays. All I did when I got ready to leave, I told, I came in yesterday, I'm taking a religious holiday. You have it. You own it. And not only is it enforced, it is recommended. Okay? Now, the Muslim children are encouraged to share about their is, to share about their religion for the purpose of teaching. It must be done. You cannot just put up menorahs and Christmas trees, okay? You have to give equal access to all religions because we live in the largest multicultural, multilinguistic society in the world. In fact, we live in the only one. America is unique unto herself. And we look at it as a salad bowl where each ethnicity, each culture has its own identity. You know, you can look in a salad, it's one salad, but you can tell the tomatoes, you can tell the lettuce. You can even tell 
the uh, iceberg lettuce from the romaine lettuce, from the butter lettuce, okay, from the cabbage to the red cabbage, the green cabbage, you know. When you put it all together, though, you have one beautiful salad. And that dressing that you put on it is that moral coating that makes, brings a society into unity. In unity, Tahid. Now, this is what teachers have been taught to tell the children now that America is no longer a melting pot. You got to stop that lie. It's not going to work. So you put everybody into the melting pot who you come out as? And I have to teach multicultural education classes to teachers who have white men who literally almost attack us when we tell them this society will no longer accept that the only way you're going to be successful is to be a white man. A Drew wrote a book, The Whining White Boy. Went through one printing. They interviewed a man on TV, you can't even find the book. You can't even find it. They took it out of instant print, okay? But when we move in this society, and we stand up for our religion, but we don't beat people with it, okay? People in my school know I'm Muslim. And most of the teachers in my school are Jewish, which is a good thing. They believe in God. They talk about the rabbi. They mad at their rabbi, at their, at their at the synagogue, you know? So we sit around lunch and everybody is free. They didn't do that when I went to that school. And one day we were going to dinner because we had a meeting after school. So, you know, we're going out to dinner. And do you know what they said? They got into a conversation, a Jewish conversation. And I really wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. And all of a sudden, it hit me. Someone said, did you notice what they just wrote in the newsletter about Muslims? Now, this is a Jewish newsletter that goes out amongst Jews. They said, this is ridiculous. How dare they talk about Muslims like that? Muslims aren't like that. And so then another one said, you know, we need someone to write in and counteract this attack that they have on the characters of Muslims. And this teacher, Randy Giannata, said, I'll write it. And she wrote that letter to that newspaper, and she gave me a copy of it. She said, we will not tolerate it. And when people attack me at my school, you know, my good friend Farrakhan, the time he opens his mouth, and I have to go to school after that, I never have to say a word. The Jews come right in and say, Joan is a Muslim. You cannot accuse him. And then they begin. And anytime they see an article in the LA Times, and our religious elders in the LA Times really does some good stuff on Islam, they come back and share it. And they let me know, did you get this? They'll cut it out. That's the impact that we have got to have in this society. And the way we have it is that we stand up for what is truth, what is real, and we respect all of the different influences in the society that are of good. And then we bring about the Tahid. Because when we look at the fact that Islam will dominate, it is the Islamic influence that will dominate. And that is where we are headed today. And so now, when religion comes back into the school district, it's the Islam that they want. They never stop teaching Christianity. They never stop teaching Christianity. You still have, I don't care what you call it, holiday, whatever. It's the Christmas program, period. It's the Christmas program. And if your little Muslim kid doesn't want to participate, let the little sucker sit outside the door. You know, every year I have Muslim children in my classroom. Yeah. And so you know what we do for holiday program? We do world peace. And we give them a song that respects all religions. Because I have fifth grade students. And our school stopped at fifth grade. And you want to make that influence. But you want them also to understand that you cannot have any type of education if there is no moral base and a belief in God. So now there's another thing that's happening when you get away from that. Current issues today in education include multicultural education, and we're all you know, pretty familiar with that. But also, 
brain-based learning. And if you don't do anything else, begin to study how learning occurs. And as I began to look at the research that Howard Gardner did, and I was talking to Sister Sophia, and we go way, 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 way back. <laughs> I'm not gonna even tell how many years we go back. And we were talking about our presentations. And she said, uh, Joan, have you read Gardner's book? I said, yeah. And she said, you know, I have that in my presentation. I said, Sophia, you can't. It's in my presentation. <laughs> you know? Harold Gardner is a professor of psychology at Harvard. And he has been studying how people learn. Now, you know how we've been told that we have low IQs, okay? And we're really not too smart, okay? As a people. I mean, you know, African Americans are just inherently born stupid. And if you want to prove it, look at the masses of African Americans out there in the streets, okay? So, so that's the proof. So we don't need to, you know, you know how you people are. The only thing that makes them like African Americans are a little better now is because we speak English. Now we, in California, we have this large Latino, Hispanic, uh, Chicano, whatever makes your day, population. And they don't speak English. So that's even worse. Okay? So now we've moved up a step, you know, uh, just because we speak English. And we're pretty obedient. Okay? Gardner says, that it is a myth that intelligence is based on IQ. That has been a control mechanism. And who are the people? Hey, I direct the gifted program, the finest and the brightest. In other words, the super nuts. Okay? Most of them are on Ritalin. Okay? They are Anglo. And so what I did in my school, I said, this is impossible that all the identified gifted children are going to be white. Mm -hmm. And this school is 72% non-white. Something is not right. So now at our school, 95% of our gifted students, identified gifted students, speak Spanish. Kids don't even speak English. I had psychologists come out and test them in Spanish. I had them take the apprentice test that's given in Spanish. Those children aced it. I said, now you say, you tell me they are not gifted for what that's worth. Okay? Now, Gardner says this. There is no such thing as people cannot learn. All people can learn, and it starts in the womb. And when it begins to sound un-Islamic, you tell me. Stop me, okay? Just reflect on Quran. And this is when, when Mus Muslims read what, about Gardner's research, it hits us like lightning. He says, okay, when they talk about the brain, the brain, it has a stem. You know, you got to the part we're familiar with. But what they don't tell us about are the neurons, okay? Now, neurons grow and develop every time you take some more knowledge in. And that knowledge makes a connection. The brain seeks patterns. And if there's no pattern, the brain throws it off. So if you really want someone to not learn something, give them a grammar book, sit down with the grammar book. Here, conjugate the, the uh, verbs, okay? Take the sentences and a diagram. The only people that are going to learn something like that are crazy people like me who just love to diagram sentences. It was fun to me, you know. So I learned real well in that area because I just happen to be a verbal linguistic type of person. And most people who go in and start teaching are that way because they were the only ones, you know, who made it through with the verbal linguistics and so then they go in the classroom and they teach and you know if you're not a verbal linguistic person in other words if you don't just sit and look at words and put them together and lump them all together then you're not very intelligent. 
Gardner says there are seven intelligences. At least he used to say that. I'll say the bombshell later. But he says there are seven intelligences. There's this in the package, and I'm not going to really get into them. And basically what happens is we learn through three modalities, and most people are familiar with that. And they say that most African Americans are kinesthetic. That's a lie. Just because we have a little more rhythm, some of us, than other people, because they told us we're supposed to have rhythm, then they say, okay, so you're bodily kinesthetic, so if you're not dancing or being a clown, then there's nothing for you to do. Okay? We take things in auditorily, okay? And then we take things in visually, okay? So what? You take a whole lot of stuff and put it in a bag, if you don't do anything with it, it didn't do you any good to put it in the bag. And this is what has happened. And Gardner says, you gave them the information, they took it in, so, all you said, so what happens is this, this is what they used to tell us as educators. You, you want to address all your learning modalities, so what you do is, when you say turn to page 26, you write it on the board to 26, the visual learners will get it, the auditory learners will get it when you said it, and the kid who's, who's kinesthetic, he'll look on the other kid's book and touch it and he'll see the 26, and so then everybody has learned. Learning has occurred, okay? Gardner said that's insane, okay? When it gets in, <laughs> you know, when it, gets, when it gets in, you gotta process it. You gotta do something with it. And Gardner says that all human beings have seven intelligences and these intelligences, what makes us different. And had you ever wondered how, you know, I mean, we know a lot is, is, is totally beyond our imagination. But how can each individual, and all these people in the world, be different? He says, because your seven intelligences all have a different um, uh, balance to each other. You know, and so now that, I said, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's how you process and develop those intelligences that gets you over. He said, in other words, it's not how smart you are, it's how you get smart. And everyone can get smart, and you can get as smart as you ever want to be. Now, if a little kid is told that, and you begin getting smart in the womb, they're finding out as they study the brain and you know how a lot talks about the clot and how it begins to, they know that. So now they're going to bring it out to you in brain research because you know what? They figure we just better go on and go on back to the Quran because if we don't, we're going to self-destruct. That's just the bottom line. Brain research that's coming out now is based on the Quran. Okay? And how a lot has set forth how we learn. Now, it says, that when the brain takes it in, it seeks patterns. The neurons are growing. And as the patterns make connection, and the pattern and, and the brain can only, the neurons only make connections when it relates. And what makes it relate is your reflection. So when we train teachers to teach in the state of California now, I don't want to see your lesson plan. Once you give me your lesson plan, then give me your reflection on your lesson plan because until you can reflect on it, you have not learned. No learning has taken place. Whole language, big controversy, right? Do you know why whole language is a controversy? Because whole language is Quranic. Allah says you have to have the whole total picture. The brain does not learn in isolation. And I'm going to tell you how. You will know. When you were in school, whichever level you went to, and you took a test, and you studied and crammed for that test, how much of it do you remember now? Mm -hmm. But if you don't remember, and those of us who are the most educated in these institutions know you, we don't remember. We barely remember the professor's name, let alone what he told. Because you don't own that information. Now, you remember when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us that if you went back in time, if you just sit back and think, 
If it's something that you knew, you have not forgotten it. Well, I wanted to bake a peach cobbler. My mother had peach trees when I was a little girl growing up. But see, I was brought up with the brainy bunch. And so I was never taught how to do stuff at home. But I used to peel the peaches. And I would watch her make cobblers and stuff. And so I looked for recipes, and I could never find a recipe that looked like the way my mother produced cobblers. So I said, I want a peach cobbler. So I sat down and closed my eyes and started daydreaming. And I'm real good at daydreaming. I mean, oh, Lord, I can, oh. I can just do it. If I get real depressed, just, I just give myself a million dollars, and I just go shop, and I have a wonderful time. <laughs> and I, my mother passed when I was a teenager. So I couldn't, I, I needed to go back and tell that, because I guess everybody doesn't know that. So I couldn't just call her on the telephone and ask her how to do it. And I remembered exactly what she did. I got up, I went and made a peach cobbler. I owned that information. And I will never lose it, okay? Now, what they have found out, if you, education, for the moment, is no good. And when the brain takes it in and begins to process it, if it is not relevant, if it is not interesting, the brain just trashes it. Why hold on to it? It doesn't mean anything to me. So here we are, taking children, putting them in a classroom, giving them a set of values that's not their value system, teaching them on something that makes no sense to them, it's like with Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus discovered America. Well, how the heck could he do that? People were here. Okay? And all those people didn't come across the Bering Strait. Some of them came down from Africa. Okay? And one was a Muslim. And they know that he was here. Abdul, Abdul Rahman, I think. They know that he was here because he left with a whole group of people, and when they went into the Maya Indians, guess what? They looked at the artifacts in Africa, and over there they were the same. No difference. But they don't put it in the textbooks. You've got to hunt for that information. Okay? But what happens is this. My children now say, well, we study about Christopher Columbus because after he bumped into America, <laughs> people decided maybe we should move over there, okay? They own that information. I wanted my students the other day, and I have a group now of children. 21 children in my classroom speak very little English. One child in my classroom speaks no English, just got to the country, just got off the plane from China, okay? I want them to really understand why the colonists decided to rebel against England. And I teach them through literature, and they had read about King George. King George, can't you make them behave? And George is telling, you know, he just, you thought the colonel should do what he told him because he was daddy. Okay? And that's where he went wrong, that one little point. Because what happened was this. Had he just said, look, colonists, we need to pay for the French and Indian War. Help us out. Help us come up and come up with a plan. But no, he just taxed them. And when they rebelled, he said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm daddy. You do what I say do. So I said, I tell you what. I said, you know how I love clothes. I said, uh, I'm going to go and buy a coat. And I want each one of your parents to give me $20 to pay for that coat. Now, they owe me that $20 because I come here and I teach you every day. You are my children. And I have to be warm to come to school. So they're obligated. When I, you, always get, you always have one kid in the classroom that's going to challenge you. He said, Miss Fonkir, that's $600. Truly, you don't need a $600 coat. <laughs> I said, honey, $600 ain't no money for a coat. You give me $3,000, I'll find a coat. You pay $3,000 for it. I said, because I love coats. I said, and it's not about that. It's not for you to even think about how much I should pay. Your mama just needs to give me $20. It's, I mean, it's not up for discussion. So what you do, I'm giving everybody a notice today. You're going to take it home. I want those parents to send in that $20. I've already bought the coat. I've got to pay for the sucker. It's on American Express. I've got to pay it for it all at one time. <laughs> so one little boy said, well, uh, I have my own money. I said, no, and I told him, I said, you don't work, so you've got to get it from your parents. He says, I work, and I have my own money. I said, good, give me your money. I don't care. <laughs> you know? 
I said, you know, I just want the $20. He said, well, I tell you what I'll do. I'll just get up and get out of your class. I said, that's right. And that's what we did. The college said, forget you, we'll just go. They have that concept, they own it, and they arrived at it. If you want children to have knowledge, what did Allah, what did the angel tell the prophet? Read. Read what? The signs in creation. This man is an unlettered prophet, right? Okay. According to Gardner's brain research, the seven intelligences determine our, how we work and maneuver in the earth, what we learn, how we make it work for us. Intrapersonal skill is your ability to deal with yourself. Interpersonal is your ability to deal with people around you. Because Prophet Muhammad dealt with himself, and developed his soul and his very being to the point that he could become a receptacle for Allah's revelation. Now you tell me he, in the intrapersonal intelligence, he was not a genius. But what good was that if he was not a genius when it came to the interpersonal? Because what the re revelation that he received and his ability to work with the people spread civilization throughout the known world. Islam began the Renaissance. That's the reason they don't want to talk about it. That's the reason this program, Islamic Spain, what does it come out? Look, all the knowledge that Europe got came out of Islamic Spain. Spain got it from the Muslims, that's just the bottom line. Now, back to Gardner's research. When I was at the ASCD conference that I really didn't want to go to, they said, Gardner has said, oh, wait a minute. There's one more intelligence. Now, Gardner has not published a book about it, but ASCD has published about it. And do you know what they call it? The naturalist intelligence. Man's ability to, to relate to his natural environment. And I said, oh, really? Now you tell me that the unlettered prophet was not a genius. But given a textbook, and this is what Gardner said, you take people out of a natural situ uh, situation, you put them into an unnatural situation, give them a test, that number one, they never took before in life, never will take again in life, okay? On a given day, at a given time, and you're gonna determine whether that person is intelligent or not with an IQ test. He said that is not what makes intelligence. That is not how learning occurs. How does that impact us? It says that we need to go into the classroom, we need to go into the PTAs, and we just need to throw the buzzwords out there. Does your school instruct on brain-based learning? Brain-based brain learning. Mm -hmm. And it's in the handout, okay? The seven intelligences are in there also, okay? Have you studied Gartner's seven intelligences? Now there's eight. It'll be out, okay? Are the children being taught where when they know they're intelligent, it's because they have all these different areas. And there are even tests where you let the children know. You let the children know, you have seven intelligences. You have eight intelligences. And the children say, oh, I'm not a dummy. Okay? When we do this, then we can take ourselves to a level that will impact the society and make it work. Basically what we want to do, rather than wonder what will become of our children, the statement that we must make now is what will our children become. Because they can be anything they dream and choose to be. Allah has given them the very talent 
the very intelligence that they need. And what they need to do is to bring about all of the skills that will develop their strongest intelligence, begin to build the other intelligences so that they become a well-balanced human being and that they have an obligation to the society and that they are to go and make a contribution and that in your world, in your field, you are a genius. Find your world, find your field, and be about getting smart. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.